This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. Well, I had, I had four older sisters, and they were always listening to music. I don't know what it was. Like, I remember being a kid, five years old, and I would just wake up, and I would be, like, singing or, you know, trying to make the sound of a guitar with my voice or something. So it was something I was always interested in. And um, I, I just – I don't know why. I, I, I didn't really like sports. I knew that from a, a, an early age. I wasn't really – you know, I wasn't really like a team sports guy, kid. And um, there was just something about music. Like I would just listen to the song over and over and over again. And uh, I don't know, I think it was, I think it was something that was kind of almost inborn, you know? <laughs> and, and in terms of like songs that you can recall listening to over and over again, can you remember any any examples of ones where you just couldn't stop listening? Uh, I couldn't stop listening to uh, well, this song. Was um, my sisters had all these? Uh, my sister's uh, ten years older than me, and um, so she she had all these uh, Beatles forty fives, and uh, and there's a song. There's a Beatles song called "I'm Down." Yeah, yeah. That guitar riff and that down, 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 you know, I couldn't stop listening to that, you know, and I loved that song so much. I loved that. And uh, the other, the other song that I, I couldn't stop listening to, either when I was a, a little kid, um, was Baba O'Reilly by by the Who. <laughs> just I don't know why I just couldn't stop listening to. It. I thought it was super cool, like the the strange keyboard and the and just the big hook and it's just like an anthem, you know. Yeah, well, uh, both great choices. I'm down. I think there's footage of the Beatles playing that at Shea Stadium, and I think John Lennon's like playing the keyboard, oh, uh, really? which was quite rare for them in their gigs. Yeah. And he's like playing it with his elbow and like yeah. making loads of goofy faces. He's kind of lost the plot, I think, because yeah. he doesn't know what he's doing at Shea Stadium. That's a great track. And Barbara O'Reilly might be the best Who song. I uh, with, and with the sync, with the, with the, arpe I think it's an arpeggiator, that kind of. Yeah. Well, I th I, the research that I did on it says, but you never know what the truth is. It was like a, an old Lowry organ and they opened up the inside of it and it had an arpeggiator kind of thing in it but you could adjust the speed if you opened it up. So you have this ba 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 And I think he ran it through through a bunch of uh, modular synthesizers or wow. something like that. And then uh, I think there was a little bit of delay going on too. So really interesting, really, really innovative. Yeah, because when was, was that late 60s that was released or was it 70s by the time uh, it was Barbara early? I think was, was uh, the album. Wow. Uh, and... Uh, so yeah, I mean, and for that time, it was very, 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 and it really ahead of its time. Things was it was it Pete Townsend who did the? Yeah, Pete Townsend did that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, great records and great influences. When did you start playing guitar? Uh, I started playing guitar when I was 13, 12, or 12, 13. Uh, I wanted to be a drummer before that, and uh, thank God my mother stopped that. Cause she couldn't take the noise you know she was nice enough to get me the garage sale drum kit and uh and um after about a week of me bashing the, sh the shit out of these drums uh downstairs you know to records you know it was just she she was like no no we got we got to go get you a guitar and i was like <laughs> okay so she, i got i got a um, yeah, I was in the eighth grade and uh, she got, she got me this guitar. It was about $35 and this little tiny guitar amp. And then, then she had to deal with that, you know, but, uh, but, you know, my mom was a really, really good musician. So was my dad. You know? 
you know, and, um, but, you know, they, you know, they, they had regular jobs and that they didn't, they weren't musicians for a living. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it was just nice that it was, it was encouraged, but, you know, there had to be limitations. But <laughs> And how how did you learn? Did you did you learn like classically? Did you get a teacher or did you play along to records? Um, I got, <coughs> I got a teacher. I think I took like four or five lessons. He just showed me the basic kind of uh, chord things. So so I learned the couple of basic chords. You know, like the, you know, G D C A. <laughs> and um, and then and then once I understood how that worked. Um, I would, I would ask one of the older kids in the neighborhood who played, you know, an instrument, show me something on the guitar. And, um, and that's, and then I kind of taught myself from there, you know, and that's, that's when, and it was, that was maybe like 1980. And, um, so, so that's how I, I picked it up and I would, and I would play along the records and, and I would literally just feel around the guitar until the note matched. And um, and then uh, that was it. And then, and then I just I wasn't uh, I wasn't very good at copying other people's uh, guitar playing, so I kind of just wound up doing my own thing. And then the Ramones came into my life, and I was just like, "This is amazing!" And the Clash, and uh, and I was like, "This is amazing! I can actually play this." Like it wasn't that hard. Like the Ramones to me were were so influential because it 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 became one of those things like like wow I can do this I can do what these guys are doing and uh, you know so then you start your band you know and you sound exactly like the Ramones for a few months you know? and and how did for those people who don't know how did Goo Goo Dolls uh, form you know how did you meet Robbie what was the situation there. Um, I was I was in college. I was I was also playing in a in sort of a hardcore punk band with his cousin, uh, and um, his cousin was leaving to go to college, um, so Robbie was going to replace him in this sort of hardcore punk band, bah, 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 you know. And um, so so. Uh, but then I met Robbie and we hung out and we had so much fun together and we were playing together. And we just said, well, we know this other guy that plays the drums, let's just start a new band. And, uh, and that's what we did. And uh, Robbie and I have been together ever since. And I was like, I was like 19 at that point in time. So yeah, I've been doing this literally my whole life, you know? So. Well, it's it's been a pretty good thing to do uh, by by all accounts. Yeah, uh, and uh, ten years were a little rough, but but after that, we've been doing well. The know. first the first ten years. Yeah, yeah, a lot and, of tours in uh, vans, a lot of broken down vans. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, coming home from a tour, being homeless you know, having to find a place to live and a job and all those kind of things. But we just kept going, you know, I think that I think that's what helped us more than anything else was our. Um, we we made it Robbie and I made a decision that we were, you know, we're, we're doing this no matter what. And um, and we did. And, uh, you know, we lost a few members along the way and a few, you know, whatever people that worked with us and that. But it was like, you know, and. So Robbie and I were just like, look, you have to set your life up so that you have nothing to lose. So not wow. what did it also being 1920, you're like, I have nothing to lose. You know, that, that was really basically the attitude. You know? So when, when you were playing those early gigs, how relentless was that kind of touring schedule for the, for those first years? As far as, you know, we, we had a different manager at the time and as, as many gigs as he could book. Um, and, and we started working after a couple of years because right from the get-go, we, we, where we grew up in Buffalo, there was a great circuit of places. Like driving, driving eight hours in the States is not a big deal, you know? But, but uh, from where Buffalo was, we were an eight hour drive to New York, Boston, eight hours or less, 
uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Toronto, Detroit, Chicago, you know, so so we would get all around, you know, and we, uh, you know, Providence, Rhode Island and, and all these all these places we would and we would just we would go out on weekends or out for a week. Sometimes we would uh, and then we picked up a real tour, a club tour um, opening for this god awful skate punk band but we were like <laughs> i don't care we just got to play uh and uh so we went out and we did two months with those guys and when we got to california another record label saw us and sort of extracted us from our first record contract and then and uh and all along it's like you know you have to magnify these tiny little victories and downplay the setbacks and, and that, that helped keep us going. You know, it's like, wow, you know, there were 200 people in the room instead of 12. So it's like, that's a big victory. Let's go. Let's keep going. You know, so. wow. And how, how did you cope with that? Because that's, you know, you're talking about nearly a decade or a decade of, of before, you know, you feel like you made it, whatever made it means. Um, uh, of course, you know, you've gone on to definitely more than make it and uh, had so much success yeah. but whenever that turn initial turning point whatever you'd classify like how did you cope with the kind of the social aspect or you know when when people are like oh so what are you up to and then you're like oh i'm gigging and you know if if there are sometimes 10 people there or five people are there yeah. or whatever you know loads of bands especially like guitar bands yeah go through that how did you kind of cope with that with the kind of raised eyebrow from people i i I don't know. It was the only thing that, that I could do well, you know, and I was learning as I was going, I was learning so much about music and, and those early tours, even if there were 10 people there, somebody would let you sleep on their floor. So you, we were being exposed to all kinds of interesting people, you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, you'd have to stay up and party with these people every night, you know? So it was like, you know, you'd have to stay up drinking with them or whatever. And, and you know, so you start to learn about music and, and, and uh, from a lot of people and, <clears throat> and art and culture and, and strange things, um, you know, and, and it, it was a great, it was a, it was a great way to go out there and, and just experience life and, and other people's perspectives on it. You know what I mean? Um, I always walked away from those encounters with people. Most of the time I walked away knowing a little bit more about music or, you know, uh, I was able to dig through people's record collections and make mixtapes for myself that I could take and, or, or people would help, help you make mixtapes and that. And, um, it was a direct sort of, um, it was learning by doing. Wow, yeah, uh, and would you say, because that sounds like an incredible time, that really does sound like a lot of fun and really life-changing, informative. Was it, do you look back on that time fondly and do you consider it to be one of the, like, the best times of your life so far? Yeah, because I, I, never, I never had a, a brother. You know, and then all of a sudden I had a bunch of brothers um, that I could be with and tour with. And, and, and we just, it was like, I have a few friends who are stand up comedians, and I asked them, how were you able to sustain yourself when you were coming up? And they're, you know, you're doing shows, you're doing 20 minutes here and 20 minutes there. And, and you're all alone, you travel all alone. And you, you know, I had, I had, we had our little van that was all done up like a pirate ship and, you know, and, and we were all together and there was, and I knew that if I was going to fail or succeed, I was gonna have people there with me to do it with. And that comforted me, you know? And um, whereas like my friends who stand ups and actors and that, um, you know, I don't know how they, you know, a, a few of them were like, well, oh, I did a ton of cocaine and it made me feel better or I drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, but, uh, 
you know, when you have a, when you have a, a group of like-minded people, um, it's, I think it's emotionally, it's a lot easier to deal with. Yeah. yeah that makes so much sense. And yeah, it's an I mean, amazing no, thing. No, I mean, no trouble started until, until we earn 10 bucks. You know what I mean? I mean, as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as you, as soon as you earn a little bit of money, then the trouble starts, you know? Yeah. Well, that seems to be the case for so many uh, bands. That's that's where the trouble starts. But one thing that's very interesting is uh, for you know listeners and fans who who don't know the kind of shift between Robbie being pri- primarily like the front man and then you becoming the front man. Like, how did that change? And was that something that you really wanted to, to happen? Well, I had, I had never really sung in a band. You know, I. I, I I mean, believe this. I when I tell you, I mean, I'm I, like crippled from shyness. You know, um, I think that's what happens when you grow up with four older sisters. Um, as far as me singing, I I didn't. You know, I I, I was I was an incredibly shy kid, and um, uh, which is the whole thing is ironic. You know, because it was like I would. I had a very flamboyant haircut and made my clothes from thrift shop stuff. And, you know, it was, we were really, you know, that's the way you used to do it, you know? And, um, but Robbie was a big inspiration to me in, in, in the respect of, you know, he, he always encouraged me. And one night I got hammered in the studio. I was really, really drunk. And uh, I was like, I think I'm going to sing this song. Let me try to sing this song. And I walk up to the microphone and started singing. And then, you know. The rest is history. And then everybody, everybody was kind of like, <coughs> you should sing. Maybe you should sing too. And I was like, okay. So I sang as well as Robert. And he still sings as well as me. And, and yeah, yeah, of course. It is what it is. You know. That's yeah that's a pretty good way of getting started with your singing career getting very drunk and uh and i think most people start that way getting the dutch courage going so in terms of when things change and it started becoming more serious and more successful what do you what do you think was like a turning point if there was a turning point uh a turning point in, 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 in what respect? Like I, in, I, in the respect of when, so you're talking about those initial years of touring. Yeah. When did things start becoming like, you know, more certain that were like, that you felt like you were going to be oh, established oh. as a band, yeah. you know, forever or, you know, as it has been, was it, was it when, when you got into the studio to make, make the first album? Because apparently that was recorded with literally like 750 bucks. Yeah is, is, yeah, is that true? We were, yeah, we were. We had a seven hundred and fifty dollar album budget, um, and we had three days. The guys that ran the studio wow. that Robbie and I worked in were very, they were, they were nice, and they were like, you know, I think they charged us like, you know, a couple of hundred bucks to do it. You know, and we we got to keep a little bit of the money, enough to buy beer. You know, and uh, and we literally we stayed up for three days and made that record, and and. Uh, you know, so exciting. I was going to make a record, you know, <clears throat> we felt like rock stars just doing that, you know? And, um, but when we, when Warner brothers, um, noticed us and then we went from metal blade to Warner brothers that felt, that felt like, okay, we're, you know, and I started to learn how to play my instrument better. And I, and I got exposed to so much other music that, that, I was like, wow, this could be so much more than just a, just, just a punk band, you know? Um, there's so much more to talk about and sing about. And like, you know, you, you, um, and we're, you know, we're really heavily influenced by post-punk and, you know, uh, 80s and 90s alternative rock and American alternative rock, college rock, whatever you call it, college, you know? Um, and, those, and all those bands and artists and then digging back into old stuff. And I, there was a guy who owned an, a record shop in Buffalo. His name was Dave Olka. And this guy used to give me uh, mixtapes of bands that I should listen to. And he's like, these are the bands that you should be listening to. He's very, very 
like the movie high fidelity music snob, you know, type guy. <laughs> and he turned me on to like, you know, like Big Star and, and Alex Chilton and the Raspberries and, and the Hollies and all these bands that, that I was like, whoa, what, what is going on here? And I'd always been a big fan of the Stones and the Kinks and who, you know. So the, the more classic elements of rock started to uh, get in sort of, sort of uh, melt into the punk thing, the quote unquote punk thing. Because punk rock to me is very, in its purest form, it has to evolve really quickly into something else. Because you, unless you're the Ramones, where it's like this is, you know, you, you see the evolution of, you know, you know, even, even like Johnny Rotten becomes Johnny Lydon and, and he's in PIL and it's a completely different animal. You know, the, the, the Clash start experimenting with reggae and, and funk, uh, yeah. you know, and it's, and it's sort of, you have to evolve. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And it's, yeah, like a lot of the big Clash singles are not exactly like punk. They kind of blend many different genres together and they become more than that, even though, you know, maybe they've still got that punk attitude or whatever. But so you had four albums before A Boy Named Goo, like, you know, went crazy, sold millions of copies, like multi-platinum record. Do you think that today there are many rock bands, guitar bands out there who would make, be able to survive and make, four albums that you know gained a following but didn't like explode uh and then continue and, and make that fifth album or even, even make that like second or third album it seems like people don't get the chance to evolve as as much these days i, th I think that's yeah well that's the music business in in the modern world of the future i mean you know um it's it's i think it's so much harder for for, for bands to get um to get noticed because it's it's the, the consolidation of media, you know, and 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 the fracturing of of musical genres into these infinite subgenres of, of music, um, you know, and I also think that because of the internet, um, people's attention span, iPhones, internet, this that, the other, gaming, um, all these things have have uh, caused people to have a much shorter attention span you know yeah um, you know i mean playing a video game can be so much more exciting than listening to music um <laughs> you know but yeah i think i think i think people's attention spans are shorter and i think that i think that the record companies and outlets for music and all those kind of things um they're less forgiving they don't I don't believe that there's talent at the, at, at the a and R level. Um, I don't believe that there are any visionaries out there. I think there's people that are chasing what's, what's big right now. And we got to get it out there as fast as possible. We need our version of band X, you know? Yeah. Whatever. So, so I think lots of lot, duplicating. Yeah. I think a lot of that goes on and they don't, they don't, I mean, we like, I decided right before Boy Named Goo came out, I'm like, look, if this album doesn't work, I got, I have to go back to school and finish. And then I have to go get a job and I'll still play with the band, but I have to get my degree and, and get a job, you know? And, um, wow. And luckily it worked. I mean, luckily it worked, but that was when that was that the, in, in one respect turning point there, was when the real work had to start. And yeah. we really had to get tough minded because before that album came out, we were critics darlings, you know? Because only people that love your when you're when you're just selling, when you're selling 30, 40, 50,000 records, the critics love you because nobody knows you and you become their darling. And um that they, they, they own a part of you, like they've discovered you and you're theirs. Yes. And it's that type of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess it's like that with fans as well. They become a bit 
resentful in some cases when artists go too mainstream i mean that's not a problem for some but no, it can be i guess but when you come especially when you were coming out of like that punk indie rock scene um people got pissed at, at us about it and they were like you sold out you did this and that, and that. And it's like no man I, I just wrote a good song and i got lucky you know to be honest with you it was like we worked our asses off but it was like you know, it's that old saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was it. And, and, and it was emotionally really difficult to deal with because people started taking shots at you. And um, you just, and that again, that's where I turned to Robbie uh, and he and I, you know, really kind of supported each other. We were like, you know, I don't know. You can beat this if you want, but we're like, fuck, fuck whoever hates us. Fuck them. Like, yeah. and I remember, I remember having a conversation with a writer who was particularly caustic about it. <laughs> and I said to him, why do you waste your time writing about things you hate? But don't, don't, don't write about me. Ignore me. Like go out there and use your platform to help people, to help musicians that you love. Well, I loved you guys. And I thought that you, you know, you, you completely changed what you did. No, 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 no. I'm growing and changing as a human being. The art or the, 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 the music or the, or the painting or whatever has to change with the person. It's yeah. health to change. You know? Yeah, you can't, and, and you can't make... Uh... You can't make your art just because of some person's ex- expectation of it. And besides, a lot it, it resonated with a hell of a lot of people, that's for sure. But uh, Dizzy Up the Girl like resonated with even more people. Uh, that must have been a huge like turning point or like building even further on it, of course, because yeah. it contains Iris as well. Um, I, but you know, you put you must have put. Like how long was the recording process for Dizzy Up the Go? Um, well, the way we used to do it was was we would, and we just did this. We we just finished two and a half months up in Woodstock, hanging out in this big old church, and I would come in. What the writing process was, we would come in. I would have ideas. I would play them for the for the band, and then we'd start playing. And then the three of us would be in a room. We just keep going and going and going until, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Oh, this idea came up or that happened or whatever, you know. Um, that's that's how the process worked. But I have to be honest with you. I was thinking about what, and I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to, to know about that process, but like how long... It, all in all was like dizzy up the girl in terms of a, oh, a recording. Yeah. Cause obviously it was three years, you know, since you'd had that turning point with a boy named goo. And yeah. it's like, just in the sense of, did, were you taking your time to capitalize on it or were you touring a hell of a lot? And then you took, we you know, however long money for the first time on, on the road. So yeah. Like, oh, we got to go. You just got to keep going, <coughs> get the money. And then, so we toured a long time on that record, over, well over a year, you know, well over a year. And, and then I had to come home and, uh, you know, have my uh, usual nervous breakdown about what I'm going to do next. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, then, and then get over that and then sit down with the guitar and start writing again. And uh, dizzy up the girl, the, the, the writing process took months but it was like I was I was uh my first marriage was breaking up at that time and um I moved to Los Angeles I was living in a hotel and started writing out there and um once again different environment different circumstances I had a little bit of money for once in my life you know so so there were opportunities to go out and have fun that that I never really had you know the whole time because I was married the whole time I got married young and then, and then um, I was with the same girl before I married her. And, um, you know, and it, it was, it was hard. Um, it was hard, but to, to break up with that person, but it really became fuel, 
you know, um, and motivation to, to just work really hard. And, um, you know, so I just buried myself in work and then, and then, you know, the writing was getting better. I thought, you know, through, throughout, um, each album had made a little step forward and, um, and that album, I don't know why, but for some reason, it just, we were working with Rob Cavallo, who we, you know, who's a great producer. And, um, and he just encouraged me to keep going. And he said something to me, I remember him saying this to me, he's like, keep writing, write until you freak yourself out and ask yourself the question, are you, are you willing to share this with everybody? Uh, and you have to be willing to share your deepest, darkest secret with everybody. You know, um, you know, you have to freak yourself out. That was an interesting way of perceiving things because then the music, be the the lyrics became a lot more personal, and they they became, you know, um, they became like little notes to people, messages to people, and that it was it was interesting, but he was able to take all the ideas and put them together into uh, a cohesive form. And, and it was, it was really amazing. We got to work in like a real studio for the first time. And, and, you know, we didn't have to worry about the budget for the record and like, okay, we got to do all the drums in three days. And then we got to do all the guitars in, in a week and we got to sing everything in two days. You know, it wasn't like that. We got you to say your time. Yeah, we got to like hang out in yeah. this ocean way recording studio. Wow. You know, and like, and I, you know, roam the halls and like see all the, the cool things that had happened there. It really, it felt like we were doing something important. You know? Well, you were. I mean, you were making a really classic record. And did you know it was going to be so? Could you tell that it was going to be a classic? No, I was, I was. I was like, I was amazed that we had one hit song, you know, and, and like what happened, at least in my case, when I had finally hit after so many albums and so many years, every, all of a sudden people who had no idea who we were, knew who, who we were. And it, I, I thought it was funny because we would save that song name for the end of the show, because if we played it earlier in the show, everyone would leave right after that we would play that song because uh, nobody knew any of our other material and it was all very fast and sort of punk kind of ish and uh and and then you play this this ballad you know which which our hardcore fans hated uh it was, it was a weird spot to be in but i was we were all determined to just make it happen so and then and and then um you know iris came along because I, I wanted to be <coughs> on a soundtrack, like, like the City of Angels soundtrack. I asked who's, who's on the record and it was like Alanis Morissette, U2, uh, Peter Gabriel. And I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta write a song for this, this thing. So I went, the music director took me through it. And then uh, I went back to the hotel that I was living in and came up with it that afternoon. And, um, and I went back and I saw him and, um, but this is the kind of thing, let me, let me just kind of backtrack a little bit. We, when I, when you're talking about how the music industry works today, as opposed to then, I played that song for the music supervisor. He was sitting behind his desk. I was sitting in the chair in front of his desk and I played it on an acoustic guitar that had four strings on it and he heard it. Yeah, and he, he was like, I'm going to put you with Rob Cavallo. Let's get in the studio. Let's cut this thing right now. People were able to hear the potential of a song. And I don't believe that that happens a lot now. Why is that? Why can't they hear the potential of the song? That, I don't believe that the record companies hire people who have ears anymore. And they don't allow a band to make little uh, steps, baby steps up. You know, it's like our first record sold a couple thousand, a thousand, whatever. Second one sold whatever. 
but we incrementally got more and more successful and we were being allowed to develop. And that I feel is like what, what's missing, but I'm starting to hear a lot of real bands again, you know, which I love. It's not all, I mean, obviously the influence, the influence of hip hop and that on popular culture is that's it. That's, that is, that is the dominant form of music, I, I believe, you know, in, in pop culture. Oh yeah, for sure. It's it's ninety nine percent of the the chart. Like you don't you don't hear any song. I mean, there's amazing hip hop, but you don't oh, hear any amazing. you don't hear any songs of like you don't hear any. It's it, a lot of it is is to do with the the sound. Yeah, uh, how big the records are, the lyrical content, the the how big the personalities are. Yeah. how big their social medias are like sometimes it's amazing and it's they're good kind of songs but they're different form like you couldn't play them on an acoustic guitar type of song right. those I, don't seem to no one seems to care about them stuff that's written real stuff that's really well written i mean some of the like some of the language man the way that these guys are manipulating language oh it's incredible it's, yeah it's fucking brilliant it's like you're like, holy shit. Like, wow. I, I, it just, it blows me away. But I also hear that hip hop influence on, you know, and once again, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like white people appropriating, you know, black music, you know, and becoming, you know, they, they're influenced by it. So it's like, all right, you know, um, that's not. But sometimes, sometimes the sound of rock bands today, I don't know how you feel about sometimes the sound of rock bands today, but in order to try and compete in a landscape where everything sounds so big and it, and is, you know, has the advantage of tech helping it sound so big to just kind of play organic instruments, acoustic instruments yeah. can sometimes just sound a bit lame on, on a, you know, top 40 record. Maybe that's why you, you don't hear it that often. No, but guitars are definitely not in vogue right now, you know? And, um, but who are the bands who made you who who made you or are making you like excited? You know the things that you were saying that you were enjoying hearing. Well, I mean, um, there's there's a guy uh, Sam Fender who I just I love Sam Fender, and I'm like this kid. Yeah, could be the voice of his generation, I think, because I think he captures the angst and the the the, the things that he's singing about. It's just like. It's, I'm like, wow, wow, this guy is really smart, really insightful, and, uh, and so talented. And that excites me. When I, when I first heard Ed Sheeran, I was like, whoa, man, this guy is so great with words. I mean, and he still excites me. I mean, it's a lot of collaborations with a lot of people, but, but you know, um, you know uh, who else? Uh, uh, well, that band in 1975. Yeah, I think it's great. I like, and you know, um, nothing, nothing that's that heavy. What I have noticed, though, I find myself experimenting with the sound of guitars more, um, and playing them differently because they're not as to stand up there and play three chords for me. I've done that. I think I'm, I think this is my 14th record that I'm working on. And so it was like, I had to approach my guitars differently, you know, like use playing them in different ways. Uh, you know, listening to, to listening to, um, like, um, oh God, God, Robert Fripp and listening to, uh, you know, guys like that that are using the, uh, Adrian Ballou, The Edge, uh, uh, um, this band Chameleons UK, you know, listening to the way these people are using guitars. The Edge, obviously, is very, like, it's huge. Like, like he's, I heard him described as being a sonic architect more <laughs> than a guitar player. But then no, I also true. talked to Pete Townsend and Jimmy Page as well. And, and Keith Richards and, and um, uh, I go back to those guys and Bruce Springsteen um, and those guys figure into the mix as well, you know? Um, 
you know, I mean, uh, a band like a band like The Killers, and I'm like, who I can hear the influence of of like they took Gang of Four and Joy Division and Bruce Springsteen and all this stuff to smash it together. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting, you know. Um, and they're also huge, and and they're great. They're great. Like, you can hear a bit of them in Sam Fender. <laughs> but I love what they did with the influences and how they bent them into a new shape and made it their own. Yeah. They, they're a great band, but you, you can hear a bit of killers. I think in um, Sam Fender, like the way he, his voice sounds a little bit like Brandon flowers in a good way. So, you know, he sounds a little bit like himself sounds mostly like himself. Oh yeah, for sure. A little more Ian Curtis earlier in his career. This is the kind of, evolution that has to occur yeah you know? and I, and that's that's you know i don't want to harp on the record companies because you know i don't even know if you need one anymore but uh no you probably uh, don't you know, maybe not the not when you just start out but when you become start becoming big i think they can blow you up even more yeah when you when you have something to sell and a lot of people want to buy it you need you need that kind of infrastructure to to um have have the widest audience yeah um you know terrestrial radio is getting a little you know the playlists are so tight and there's so few people at least in the states um you know uh programming there's like four people programming the majority of the music that you hear yeah so the gatekeepers it's just all the power in, in a few hands and yeah you know and radio has become this thing it's like it's like real estate whatever yeah. and the most money for the ad time is what they're going to play is the music that they're going to play so you know um you know this uh, this album i approached very differently with, with with trying to i purposely said to myself i i'm not trying to get a, a song on the radio you know, I'm like, I don't care if I get a song on the radio on this, on this record. I, I'm like, I'm at a point in my life and my career where I'm like, okay, you know, it would be nice, but I don't want to have to change myself completely to get in, to fit into whatever's popular now. Yeah. You just want to write, write, make the music that you want to make. And I think that will resonate. I think it will too. You know, this is the first time I haven't really... I've done a lot of collaborating over the last 10 years um, for a few reasons, you know, but uh, one of them is fear, you know? Um, but I, I just said to myself on this one, you got, you got to man up, John, and sit down and play your guitar and play the bass and play the piano. And I'm terrible on the piano, but find the, the melody you know, and build it. You, this is a journey that you got to make on your own again. And, uh, and it's interesting, really interesting. Oh, I bet it's going to be amazing. But what about the, the rarities record that's coming out late, l- later this month, I believe. Yeah. Uh, what, what, why did you decide to bring that out? And why did you, how did you choose what was going to go on it? Um, okay. So, um, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but it's they they used to have these things called DAT tapes. Remember, they're digital audio tapes. It was like it was like a piece of tape, but it was encoded with digital, whatever binary code or whatever you call it. And um, um, we used to demo everything onto these DAT recorders, and um, and you would get your your you would get your finished masters and that on that. And um, so my manager was moving out of his office and he literally had boxes and boxes and boxes of DAT tapes and um, nothing to play them on. So I went on eBay and I found him a DAT player, um, you know, for like $300, this obsolete piece of audio equipment. And, um, and he started listening through all these DAT tapes and then he he picked it out. He kind of curated the whole situation. And then I listened to it and I'm like, some parts of it to me are a little cringy, but I'm like, you know, it's like, 
it is what it is. I wanted to call it from the trash, but, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Um, um, but, but, uh, but I dig it. I dig it. I think it's interesting. There's, there, there's some interesting versions of things on there, you know? And it, yeah, for sure. Very, there's a very, there's a very raw sort of, uh, it's the rawness that's so interesting. Yeah. You know, to me too, because it's like, you know, we've worked with very fine engineers and fine producers and, and, uh, you know, we've made some really commercially successful albums and some that aren't so commercially successful. And, and you know, if, you know, if you're going to have a career, if you're going to make a career out of music or art or whatever, you are going to come in and out of style. And you got to hang on, you got to hang on. You got to know who your friends are <laughs> uh, because you gain them when you're up and you lose them when you're down. And the ones that are there through the whole thing, they're, they're the real deal. Well, I think uh, rarities definitely shows the kind of the underlying, the song craft and, 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 you know, the talent, the raw talent. Uh, and so that's why it was really interesting to listen to. Uh, so I would really recommend it to to the listeners. And yeah, thank you so much, John, for joining me on the podcast. It was awesome talking to you. A real honor. Talking to you. And good luck. Um, thank you. And, and uh, keep going, man. Keep going. Do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.